This is Major League Baseball Magazine, presented by Fritos. ESPN presents Major League Baseball Magazine's Minor League Show. This week's cover story, from the publishing house to the clubhouse, Rick Wolf rolls back time in the minors. Well, I was surprised he got the first in that wheelchair that he was in. We'll bring back a blast from the past. A minor league star who goes boom in the night. Any trick to doing this? Just hoping that the dynamite is set right. And after 16 years, a three-point shot goes swish. Wouldn't it be funny if somebody hit, you know, actually hit one through it, and uh, most of the guys said it can never be done. This is Warner Fusell for Major League Baseball Magazine's Minor League Show. Presented by New Wild and Mild Ranch-flavored Frito brand corn chips. Rustle up some. His name is Rick Wolf, but don't go searching for his baseball card just yet. For Rick, you see, is a senior editor in New York with a baseball past. I played ball at Harvard in the early 70s. In 1971, as a sophomore, I played in the College World Series. In 72, I was drafted by Detroit. I uh, ended up playing two years of minor league ball as a second baseman in the Tigers chain. I uh, was bypassed by a fellow named Lou Whitaker, and I often wonder what happened to Lou Whitaker after all these years. But uh, I got into to writing. In fact, uh, while I was playing minor league ball, I, I kept a diary. And that diary became a book uh, called What's a Nice Harvard Boy Like You Doing in the Bushes? Rick understands the need to write about what you know. And that's why he got the chance to don a minor league uniform once again. I was talking with some friends over at Sports Illustrated. And I said to them, uh, you know, you probably haven't noticed this, but uh, this, this marks the 15th anniversary of my last year of pro ball in the Midwest League. I said, I'd love to go back and write a piece about what happens to kids these days in their early 20s, the dreams, the frustrations, the ambitions. Fortunately, uh, the White Sox, uh, Larry Himes, the general manager, and Al Goldis, the director of scouting, said, sure go out to South Bend uh, and we'll let you play two or three games. Now I should point out that at that point in the season, the South Bend team had already clinched the first half pennant. And that week, when I went to tell my, my boss, Bill Rosen, that I was taking a couple of days off to go out and play baseball, you can imagine the reaction I received. When you say baseball, you mean softball, right? Slow pitch softball or something? No, it, it's, um, it's real baseball. I, I've just signed a contract with the South Bend White Sox. When he told me what it was about, I immediately expressed disbelief. Of course, we approved it or he would not have gone. So, literally, it was a jump from being here in this, in this office in Midtown Manhattan on a Wednesday. That day, I flew out, got out to, uh, to South Bend, suited up, practiced, and bingo. And he comes in and uh, not much hair on his head. In fact, uh, he has uh, less hair on a head than our mayor does, and the mayor is, is about 10 years older than he is. Met Rick Patterson, who's a, 
I guess about three or four years younger than I am. And of course, was a little bit skeptical as to why in the world is this 37 year old book editor coming out to play baseball. And I said, Rick, just bear with me. You know, I won't kill myself. I won't hurt you guys too badly, but let me have my day in the sun. And he said, well, okay, let's see. First thing I want to do is always get a look at my ball players when they're out there on the field. And so I said, come on, get out there and get dressed. When I saw him at second base taking ground balls and I was out at the same position, and I thought he was just a coach just messing around until he said he was going to be playing in the games for the next few days with us. And that really surprised me until I found out later who he was and what he was doing here. I throw bat in practice and I take a look every time he'd hit a ground ball his way and try to see you know, how his hands were made. Not too bad. I said, he's, he's not going to get hurt. At least he can stay in front of the ball. But although the bounce of the ball had stayed the same, Rick soon discovered that the Midwest League had undergone quite a change. Kowaleski Field at, at South Bend, it's brand new, great lighting, terrific seating. Uh, you take an elevator from the, uh, from the players level up to the, uh, the general manager's office. They have plush carpeting. I remember the days of, of minor league baseball. Uh, whether I played in the Midwest League or down in Florida or in South Carolina with the, the pe green paint peeling off the fences and the splinters on the bench and the poor lights and the, the dogs running across the field, the beat-up buses. That's what I think is minor league baseball. This was a whole different set of circumstances. And uh, the, the Cove, as they called out in South Bend, was just a tremendous facility. It was the best I've ever played in. Rick did not start his first game in uniform, but that doesn't mean he didn't get involved and figured I'd settle down and watch the game from the bench except for the fact that in the seventh inning with a no hitter being thrown by the Chicago by the South Bend White Sox pitcher all of a sudden there was a bench clearing brawl when one of the opposing players was hit by a pitch and hey I'm in uniform I know the first rule in baseball brawls don't be the last guy on the bench I'm out there thinking now I have really no beef against the Burlington Braves but I'm a member of the Sox, therefore I have to be out there. I'm grabbing bodies and trying to you know, restore uh, law and order. Somebody knocked me down. He beat me out on the field. And uh, I, I, don't, I never saw Rick after the fight started, so I don't know if he was on the bottom of the pile or whatever, but you know, he got a taste of everything. And before you know it, four players were tossed out of the game for the South Bend Sox. And the manager, Rick Patterson, says, hey, Wolf, grab a bat, you're up next. I'm thinking, this isn't really happening, is it? <laughs> I mean, 24 hours ago, I had a nice job in Manhattan in a publishing house, and here I am going to face some kid who's 20 years old, throwing a fastball at 90 miles per hour. And as it turned out, I, I grounded out weekly to short and uh, ran down to uh, first base for an easy out, and that was it. But there was more the next day. A day that fiction took a back seat to a most improbable biography. For at the plate, Wolf was far from sheepish. Slider, oh yes. And there's the base knock in the right field. Well, listen, there's hope for us old guys. He's not calling for the That's, ball. Well, I, think I think they should give him the ball. I mean, he's playing it just like he's here all year long. Look at him. I mean, you know, here's Rick Wolf. Fly ball to right field, and oh, a sweetheart of a go. He dropped the ball. A base hit for Mr. Wolf. He is two for two. Ground ball, a second. Wolf, the second for the force out, and the Sox are out of the inning. Here, absolutely, is the finest player on the field tonight, and he's the only one that can write about it. There's the little fly ball, and let's see if the runner comes. Here's the throw to the plate, and it's up the line. Runner safe. Runner goes back to his first base, and he's out. Rick Wolf, once again, the man of the hour. I tell you what, Rick Wolf set the scouting profession back about 20,000 years. <laughs> Never in my wildest dreams could I have ever imagined two for three back in uniform for the South Bend White Sox. It was great. Everybody figured that was it. That was my, my day in the sun. There's no way in the world that the next day this could repeat itself. But sure enough, I, I took my my Tylenol and got my uh, my my Bengay out that night. Went to bed Thursday night. Came back for more action on Friday. Another base hit. Ended that night going two for three, including my last at bat, which was a double off the right center field wall with men on second and third for two RBIs. I remember the shortstop from Burlington. Couldn't be more than 19, 20 years of age. Came over to me and he said, "No offense, Mister, but how the hell are you doing this?" <laughs> I couldn't give him an answer. 
by posting the highest average in the Midwest League this year, Rick did both his family and especially his sportscaster father most proud. I've been very, very lucky during my career. Baltimore Colts, New York Giants, the greatest game ever played. I broadcast that. And in baseball, of course, the most memorable moment, I broadcast the Don Larson no-hitter, the perfect game. But when it comes to emotional thrills, boy, this one was unsurpassed. Watching Rick coming back after 15 years and playing ball like that, I was out there cheering and yelling, can't do that in the broadcast booth, you know. It was really tremendous. What a personal experience for me. South Bend won the Midwest League, and the players voted Rick a ring. What's more, the South Bend mayor, who definitely has less hair than Rick, presented South Bend's newest hero with a key to the city. Rick played very well, and I think is living proof that all ball players uh, can come back. I think the uh, people that cheered the most when he got his hits were the people in the stands that were 40, 45 years old that were very pleased to see somebody else that could go out and do something like that, get that one last shot. He was sort of like an, an idol for us and say, hey, you know, we're not over the hill. And it's sort of like the old saying, it's not over till it's over. Well, I, I think he, uh, he made a, a good point in showing uh, the people that you can still come back and, and succeed. I noticed all the kids, the kids under the age of 10 or 12, they wanted autographs from the guys, the regular players in the South Bend Sox. They didn't come to me. Their parents came to me for autographs. So what about this budding Mini Minoso? Would he do it again? Would South Bend want him to do it again? You know, he was such a catalyst on the ball club in the time that he was here. We'd love to have him back. I signed a contract with the, the South Bend White Sox, typical player's contract, for $850 a month. Uh, it was supposed to be a three-day contract, but I will tell you that I have not been released yet. Uh, I spoke to Larry Himes about a week or so ago, and I figured this was the call to be recalled in the 40-man roster. He said, well, no, we're going to save you, I think, for next year. So we'll see what happens next year with the Sox. But they have my number, and I'm still in the contract to, to South Bend at this time. In the news, Joe O'Brien Field in Elizabethton, Tennessee, where for 16 years, this outfield fence incentive has awaited a player who could hit one through it. Well, meet Tom Hardgrove of the Martinsville Phillies, who left them practically speechless. We were sitting in bullpen with a boy named Jeff Malene. He said, there goes a bomb. And I said, hey, he said, that's a ghost shot. And sure enough, hey, first time in my life. And about eight years ago, I seen a player hit it off the rim. I couldn't believe it. It's a shock. It's just like a stun in the stands. It just got quiet for a second, and everybody stood up. It's an unreal shot. I didn't realize it was that big of a deal until somebody told me, you know, it, it, it been up for about 16 years and that uh, no one had ever hit hit one through so um, I guess that's big time news around here I don't know I'll, I'll probably forget about it here in a couple of weeks a grand ground rule double and one floored promoter I wasn't a bet on it thought it was a lock but really we've always been in in sports all of our life and tried to help it in every way that we can and we thought this was just a good idea to promote the game of baseball and I never thought I'd ever pay a thousand dollars for an autographed baseball but maybe whenever he makes it in the majors I can get my money back. Maybe Tom was inspired by the movie Bull Durham but maybe not. When I saw Bull Durham I didn't think it was that good of a movie so I really don't remember about it. Everyone knows Kevin Dykstra, an umpire in the California League. But did you know that Kevin has an older brother in the major leagues? His name is Lenny Dykstra, and he plays outfield 
for the Phillies. I always go to different cities and I always hear like, where's your brother? And you know, you wouldn't call pitches on your brother like that. And so I hear his name pop up when, whenever I'm in town somewhere. Dealing with the spotlight is no problem for Kevin. But as both a Philly and Met, big brother Lenny sometimes tries to steal the stage. I've always been, been one of the guys known to get on the, the umpires, and especially in the minor leagues, I uh, had quite a reputation. So he's putting up with it. I know I've asked him about it, and he said there's been a lot of uh, things that have happened. He's taken a lot of ragging and stuff just because of his names. I'm kind of the, the laid back kind of you know, umpire. I'm not a hothead. I don't go out there looking for trouble. You know, I try to do my job and uh, stay out of trouble, but I don't get like him. I try not to, at least. But what if someday Lenny is at bat and brother Kevin is behind the mask? What then? Maybe be me behind a plate in the World Series and a full count to outs bomb the ninth and borderline pitch. Who knows what's going to happen? <laughs> It's been another year of frustration for the Chicago White Sox. Last place, almost 30 games off the pace. But not so down on the farm, where three White Sox minor league teams won championships, including the Birmingham Barons of the Class AA Southern League. The Barons forged an 88 and 55 record, thanks in part to Robin Ventura, former Olympian and a number one draft choice in 1988. Dubbed the runaway train by the Birmingham trainer, the Barons on occasion even took to wearing engineer hats. Birmingham had an amazing 53 and 18 first half record. And then the Barons won six straight games in the playoffs, eventually beating the Greenville Braves. A sign of hope for Chicago that someday soon, the crew of this runaway train will carry the freight. Hey, I'll tell you what, it doesn't get any better than this. I played on a loser for so long, now it's great to be a winner. Here then is the call of the champion. This ESPN program is presented by Budweiser Beachwood Age for that clean, crisp taste this buds for you. There's a triple-A team in Omaha, Nebraska that's awash with active minor league career leaders. Among them, 114-game winner, pitcher Steve Fireovid. It probably doesn't mean as much as you might imagine. Uh, it's actually kind of discouraging. I mean, obviously, every time I go out, I'm going to try and win. Uh, that's what I'm here for. But uh, I probably don't have a whole lot left to prove at the AAA level, you know. And, I, and I'm not kidding anybody. If, you know, I can't pretend to be something I'm not. I'm a fringe pitcher. I'm not going to make a staff in the big leagues and have that staff revolve around every day that I throw. And I, I know that. You know, and if I show that I don't belong there, you know, I can live with that, you know, but I don't, I don't think that would be the case. But Matt Winters also played for Omaha, and with 190 home runs, he was second among active minor leaguers. 
Well, I had 178 going into this year, and I got another 12, so that totals up to about 190. So I'm missing it by 10 home runs. I got 200 coming to me. Why isn't Winters the minor league leader? Because with 191, teammate Tom Dodd is. Me and TD were going into the season, we're tied, and uh, he had, I think, one more than I did this season down there in the minor leagues. But I got him, I got two up here, and he only had one in the major leagues, so I, uh, we evened out there. Dodd and Winters have been matching home runs throughout their minor league careers. Me and Matt played together way down in the lower, lower A ball, and we both had good years that year. And uh... We had a, a little group called the Master Blasters, and whoever hit the most home runs was the leader of the group, and unfortunately, Tommy got to hit the most home runs that year, so he was our, our president of the group. Dodd might have more home runs, but Winters says his stroke has more smoke. I definitely have more power than Tommy. Uh, he can style more around the bases. He looks better in a uniform, but I can hit, I can hit the ball longer than he can. But it's Dodd who may hold the minor league home run crown, as Winters has a good shot at the majors. This year to play was real special because I'm at the end of my career and he's getting to the major leagues now. And to see him get his chance in the major leagues was, was a real big thrill to me. To see I've had my chance and you hate to see a guy like that not get a chance. Our stat of the week deals with Vancouver's Tom Drees of the Pacific Coast League and the attention he got this year by pitching back-to-back no-hitters. The media uh, impact has slowed down the last couple days, or I guess since my last start, really, but before that, it was really hectic and really crazy. So that was kind of fun, and that's basically the biggest change I had to deal with. But Tom really achieved cult status a few weeks later when he pitched another one. It's really amazing. I mean, I never expected it. I just wanted to go out and throw good games. I've been struggling, and it's hard to believe that it happened again, but it's a nice feeling. You throw three no-hitters in one season, and everyone wants a piece of you. Well, almost everyone. Once again, the minor league's master blaster, Captain Dynamite. Why does a 72-year-old guy do something like this? Why? Well, it was a challenge for me. <laughs> Just a challenge. It's uh, doing something that very few other people care to do. I think he's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> What's the worst that's ever happened to you doing that? Had a chunk grown out on the right side. I had to take a piece out of my hip to patch it up. Fill in, the, fill in the meat hole or dug into me. I think Captain Dynamite is a pretty good man. A little uh, too heavy a charge that day? Yeah, too heavy of a charge. Not too heavy a charge, too close to me. I could tell you about it, but it's going to take time. Do what I want you to. Baby, we'd be so far. Oh, life would be a dream. If I could take you up in paradise up above. I hope everything goes off. On schedule, because I sure hate to hear, get up and miss her and have her hear somebody say boo. Every time I look at you, something is on my mind. He's okay, ladies and gentlemen. Let's do it for the one and only Captain Dynamite. I like to be dreaming. How does a guy get started blowing himself up? How do, how'd you get started? Well, you take an ordinary person, don't know much anyhow, and knock the rest of his brains out with a bad baseball bat. And, and there you got yourself a stuntman.
deck for next season, this year's minor league stars get their crack at the big time. And he has his first major league hit. Not only is it his first major league hit, but these may be two guys who might prove to be great players, Robin Ventura and Ben McDonald. Got it. First strikeout for Merker. And in his third major league start, shuts out the Cardinals on four hits. A brilliant outing for Pat Combs. This is Warner Fusell. Major League Baseball magazine is presented by new wild and mild ranch-flavored Frito brand corn chips. Rustle up some.